Welcome to Rod Zombie's A Nightmare on Elm Street audio commentary. This video has no footage of the film in it. If you would like to sync this commentary with your copy of the movie, set the timestamp to zero and I will do a countdown. One, two, three, play. I love this opening sequence. I like how it's all in close ups and tight shots. This all takes place before he gets burned. Now this of course is Tina. If you've seen the movie Psycho you know that a precedent was set where just because you have a character that seems like the lead doesn't mean they're going to survive the whole movie. And Tina is definitely of the Marion Crane type who won't survive the whole film. One of the things I really like about this movie is the set design. In this one in particular you've got a lot of wet, a lot of smoke. Robert Englund, he'll always be Freddy to me. He just brings so much to the role and it's not just how he talks, it's also how he walks and how he moves. Robert did a lot of thinking and if you listen to a lot of interviews with Robert, he'll talk about how he came up with certain traits. And I just think it's the sign of an actor who really took this seriously and wanted to bring something different to the role. And it's definitely much different to Jason and Michael, not just because they don't talk and Freddy does, but also because... Freddy has such a distinct way of standing and moving that it really sets him apart from those two and also any other slasher villains that have come after. Rest in peace, Wes Craven. This is the first horror film I ever saw. Thanks, Wes, for this horror movie and also for others that you've worked on. Tina's running pretty slowly here. I think this is just a reference to how in dreams where you're running, you sometimes have ones where you feel as if you want to run fast, but something's stopping you and you're actually running slowly. Okay, so she survived this nightmare. Now we get a clue as to the rules of the movie here. So Freddy, when he scratched her dress and cut it, when she wakes up, it's like that in real life. As if that's a choice. I always found that line quite interesting. As if you could actually choose not to have that happen. Especially in a situation like this movie presents where Freddy Krueger is the one who's in control of all the nightmares. Now this is the jump rope song. Pretty eerie, pretty creepy. And it's been used in the movies quite a few times. So of course we have Heather and her boyfriend Glenn. 
and here's Rod. Now when I first saw this movie I was 11 years old so you can imagine being named Rod as well, seeing a guy in the movie named Rod get killed sort of had some effect on me. Back then that is, not now. I just think it's quite an interesting thought that I had when I was younger. Now they don't yet know that they're all dreaming about the same guy. And Glenn himself has dreamt, but he hasn't he hasn't told anyone, and he won't tell anyone. Well, you're having a premonition, Tina, but it's not about an earthquake. Now, here's a funny moment. It's probably one of the uh, biggest moments of comedy in this movie, but it's not over the top. Now, this was back in the 80s, so we didn't have computer programs where we could record the audio and then edit it and make sure that the entire recording had things on it that match exactly what this this is trying to be. So he plays the tape. The start of the tape works for him, but then there's extra stuff that's been recorded. Now, if he had a computer program, he would have been able to make sure that all that recording was enough to cover the phone call, but it's not. Now watch Glenn's reaction in a moment. Love that music. See Glenn's reaction here? As soon as they said red and green sweater, that's when he looked at them. Now he's actually had a dream about Freddy, but he hasn't told anyone. Imagine dreaming of the same person that someone else has, especially when neither of you have actually seen the person and you can describe them accurately. This scene here, if you've seen the movie before, doesn't have the same impact that it has on first viewing because you know that Freddy Krueger isn't going to jump out at them, because Freddy Krueger only operates in the dream world and not in the real world. So it doesn't ruin the film, it just means that you're not going to think of this scene the same way, and it's not going to have the same impact for you as it would have done the first time seeing this movie. Now it's interesting the gardening tool that Rod actually has chosen. It's interesting the gardening tool that Rod chooses because it's just like Freddy Krueger's claw. And it gives us an indication that Rod has had a dream of Freddy Krueger as well, but like Glenn, he hasn't told anyone.
There's a funny little bit here where Nancy almost goes in the wrong room and Glenn just guides her to go the other way. And it's just a little thing that I've noticed on this viewing. It's not a, a massive mistake or anything that takes anything away from it, but it just goes to show that maybe in that take, Heather accidentally thought that she had to go in one direction when she didn't. This is, of course, Tina's room now that Heather is sleeping in. Five, six, grab your crucifix. What this movie does really well is it makes you question when someone is having a dream and when they're still in reality. If you try and work your head around all the details, you could almost make your head explode. Okay, so this effect here, don't you just love how they used all the computer graphics of the day that they had to do this scene? What? They didn't use computer graphics? How the hell did they do that? Quite, quite effective. Just an in-camera on-set effect. Now, did Freddy start to go back into the wall because she started to wake up? This one doesn't have it as much, but other movies in the series have more of a fantasy feel to them with the fact that Freddy can control dreams and manipulate them and make what he wants to appear, appear. The other question is too, when Tina's walking around in her dreams, why is she just not moving in in the bed, but yet when she gets thrashed around by Freddy later, when she's being killed, she's still in the dream and just being moved around. She still has to be in the dream because she can't just be awake, otherwise if she was awake she would have just dropped right back under the bed. So now we actually get to have a good look at Freddy Krueger.
and Freddy Krueger is the god of the nightmare. Actually, when you think about it, he's more like the devil of the nightmare. And see, he just wants to play with them. He doesn't want to just run up and kill them straight away. He likes to gross them out, likes to creep them out, and that kind of thing. So he's very different to a Michael or a Jason in that respect as well. It's also a more psychological approach. So now Rod wakes up. The thing is, Tina is being thrashed around by Freddy in the dream. She hasn't woken up yet. Now we got a hint earlier that when her dress was cut, we got a hint that whatever happens to you in your dream will be reflected in reality once you wake up. And of course now we finally know that Freddy can actually kill you in your dream and when you die in your dream, you die for real. Now is Tina awake or is she still asleep? If she was awake, why didn't she drop to the bed earlier than this? See? Just don't know. Yep, so Nancy's wearing number 11. Here's John Saxon. This was the first film I saw John Saxon in, and the second one was Enter the Dragon, a Bruce Lee movie which is awesome, and this was ten years after that film. He was also in a western that I saw. He's been in quite a few, but I've only seen one of his So, of course, they're separated. So, it's one of those things where we know what's happening, where the parents don't as yet anyway. This is an example in this movie of the theme where the parents don't listen to their kids when they're telling them that they're having nightmares about this killer. She hasn't mentioned anything about the nightmare, of course, but the thing is, the fact that her mother thought that she was saying that this isn't that serious just goes to show that she wasn't actually listening to what she was saying. But still, to everyone else, it's just, it's not, they don't know that Freddy Krueger is killing people in their dreams. Now this is the voice of Robert Shea. It is thanks to him that we got three Lord of the Rings movies instead of just one or two. He's one of the people that is responsible for that happening. So thank you, Robert Shea. That was awesome. Coffee, of course, is your friend in these movies.
There's that awesome music again. I love it. So we know that Rod's innocent. We know he hasn't done the, the murder. It's always interesting in movies where the audience knows what's going on, but there's some characters who don't believe the situation or don't have any idea yet. And sometimes it can be frustrating for the audience because it's like you just want to shake the other people and say, don't you know what's happening? Can't you see what's happening here? But it's not something that ruins movies. These kinds of things that I'm pointing out, they're just observations. They don't, they don't ruin the movie. It's just an interesting thing when you've seen a movie more than once. How you as an audience, your perception of what you're watching actually changes. And here, of course, is Lynn Shay, Robert Shay's sister. This is another one of those interesting scenes. There's actually a scene in Halloween where it's a teacher talking to the students. And, of course, that's a completely different movie to this one. Now, at that moment, has she entered the dream? That's another thing. Because now we know that she's dreaming because she looks over and what does she see? So she's dreaming, of course. Obviously. I love this. Sounds so cool. Now again, Nancy is getting up out of her chair, she's dreaming, but she's actually in reality still sitting in that chair. Love that moment. There's just so many moments in this movie that are so effective. Look at that blood trail. I love that moment when Freddy's voice comes through. No running in the hallway. I love it how there's leaves and everything here now that have just turned up. It's like dreams where just random things happen. You enter a dream and you can't remember entering it. You're in one location one minute and then the next second you're in a completely different situation, completely different location. You've got no idea how you got there. Things come into your dream and it's like, how the hell did that get there? And this is one of the things that I think this horror film really conveys well.
Love it how he walks out like that. See his stance that Robert Anglin gives Freddy? So it's also the thinking that goes into the role as well. This is the moment in the score where it's sort of like an action score. The thing about Freddy is that he absolutely loves what he's doing. Takes a lot of joy in it. Come to Freddy. So I definitely can say that in this movie, the only time when the person being attacked by Freddy will actually show any signs in reality that they're moving is when they're being attacked or they're just getting out of the dream. So Nancy never left her chair. She didn't go sleepwalking in that whole scenario. She was still in the, in the chair. And as soon as she burnt her arm, that's when she woke up and had the reaction. kind of interesting because in the Nightmare on Elm Street 3 one of the characters looks like he's sleepwalking to the others so that kind of breaks that rule if you will now the great thing about Nancy in this movie is she's always learning so right now she looks at her burn and she understands that whatever happens to you in your dream is reflected in reality once you wake up. Nancy is so gorgeous in this movie. She is in the third and the seventh as well. And Heather Langenkamp is still a beautiful woman, even today. I just love her blue eyes in this scene. Now, if he told this to anyone else, they would think he is completely nuts. But of course, Nancy, through this conversation, comes to believe him. So now he reveals that he was dreaming of Freddy too. But no one else is going to believe him. Only Nancy does.
Now there's a movie idea. Jaws vs Freddy Krueger. There's Freddy, of course. Okay, so since Nancy's being attacked in the dream, when she yells out, her mum can hear her. Because it's just like when Tina was being dragged around the room, Rod could see her being dragged and hear her screaming. Now I love this. When I first saw this movie, I hadn't seen Evil Dead yet. So it's funny to think that technically I had seen a bit of Evil Dead years and years before I eventually got to see the movie. Now for those who don't know, there's actually a joke that was going between Sam Raimi and Wes Craven. In the Evil Dead, there's a poster of The Hills Have Eyes, but it's been ripped. And Sam Raimi has said that it was to say that you think that that movie is true horror? This is true horror. And so in A Nightmare on Elm Street, they play the evil dead. So Wes is kind of saying, you think that the evil dead is true horror? This is true horror. I'm pretty sure that in Evil Dead 2, in the cellar, you see Freddy's glove. So that was Sam Raimi saying, you think A Nightmare on Elm Street is a true horror? Evil Dead 2 is a true horror. How strange would that be to hear that? Which is kind of funny because I think she actually was 20 when she filmed this. No, Nancy knows that Rod didn't kill Tina, and we know that Rod didn't kill Tina. Okay, so of course, Nancy is doing an experiment in this scene. You've seen the movie before. We know that she's going to learn something extra as well.
Nope. He's asleep. So he's already failed. The Nightmare on Elm Street theme is one of my favourite themes. It always gives me chills whenever I hear it. So we know from the classroom scene that at the moment Nancy is still asleep in her bed. She's not sleepwalking while she's walking in the dream. And see, Freddy, he knows that she's watching. This bit is creepy and disgusting. I love it. I love horror movies. It's my favourite genre of all time. The thing about horror movies too is I don't think jump scares are scary. Basically what I consider scary is if you watch the movie and then weeks later you're still thinking about it and can't get over it and every time you think about it you're afraid of it. That's a horror movie to me. That's really being scared. Jump scares, any movie can have it. Any genre, doesn't matter. Jump scares that are done well are good but ones that are just basically the music going Bleh! really loudly at a given moment is just not scary and you could put it in an action movie, you could put it in a comedy, it would, you'd get the same reaction from a lot of people. I haven't actually really had a dream like this but something similar where I've been running but I've been running very slowly because it feels like I'm running in mud even though there's no mud anywhere in the dream. Of course, Glenn is asleep. Now the funny thing is, this is a similar situation to when Tina was being attacked by Freddy. Rod woke up because of the commotion, and yet Glenn isn't waking up because of this commotion. Granted, what was happening to Tina was more extreme than what was happening to Nancy right here, but the thing is, you would think that Glenn would wake from it, but perhaps he's just a deep sleeper and he hasn't heard anything. It's only the alarm clock that wakes him, because it's a really loud, distinct sound. This bit here is an example of how Nancy's mother does actually care about her daughter. It's just that there's other points in the movie where she doesn't listen to her when she really should. And that just ties into the whole theme of this movie. 
where the parents don't really listen to what their kids are telling them. Yes, it is urgent, because Rod is about to be killed by Freddy. The interesting thing about Rod's death here is that because it's a hanging, it obviously looks like a suicide to other people. Of course, Nancy knows better. The thing is, too, Freddy being able to kill people in their dreams and then they die in real life. It also adds another level of intelligence to the character because he understands how the other people are going to see the victim once the murder is done. And it would make sense that in this situation, he wants to make it look like a suicide. I'm pretty sure this is the tamest kill in the series. Too late. Funeral scenes. Get used to it in this series. You'll see a lot of them. Of course, we know what actually happened, so what the priest says here about he who lives by the sword dies by the sword, while a true saying I believe in life, the fact of the matter is, we know that Rod didn't kill Tina, and basically he's saying this about an innocent man. Their reactions here are interesting. On a first viewing, you might just think that they're reacting that way because it's a strange story that Nancy is telling. Of course, if you've seen the movie before, you know that they're thinking at this point, how the hell does Nancy know about Freddy Krueger? I don't actually keep a dream journal, but it might be a good idea to start one one day. When I wake up from a dream, I tend not to try and force the memories. That way I seem to remember a lot more. I love this music right here.
is probably one of my favourite pieces of score, aside from the main theme. I actually used this in my tribute video, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Nancy's Nightmare. This actor here, who plays the Doctor, he's Charles Fleischer. He voiced Roger Rabbit in the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit. He's also in the Tales from the Crypt movie Demon Knight as well. Wouldn't it be so awesome if you could actually record your dreams while you're having them and then afterwards when you wake up you can play them back and actually study them. It'd be cool to be able to actually pause on certain things and look at your dream and try and work out what the meaning might be and it would also be great if it could pick up any audio that happens as well. One of the things that makes this movie really good is even if you've seen it quite a few times, you are still able to be drawn in by what's happening and what's going on. And I think that's just a testament to how good this film really is. It's also a good sign of a good horror movie too. The thing about this is that we don't actually go into the dream that Nancy's having. So this is more for the perspective of the mother and the doctor because they're observing Nancy in this state and what they're actually seeing is the outward reality effects of what's actually going on in the dream. And the other thing is there is no way that Nancy would have been able to cut herself on anything that's in the room. And the other thing too is that how the hell would she get this hat in? There is no way that she could get this hat in because they had to actually set all this up for her and she had to get dressed and had to get into the bed. So the fact that they're surprised by the hat getting in there and how does she do it, it's just one of those things where I really think that it's another example of how the parents in this movie don't really understand what's actually happening, even though it's right in front of their eyes, the truth. See, Nancy isn't stupid, and that's one of the things that I really like about the character. She's always trying to get to the bottom of things. She doesn't give up. She investigates. The mother in this scene is trying to keep things from her, and the thing is, though, that eventually she's going to have to tell Nancy the truth. If you look at it from Marge's perspective, what Nancy is saying about Freddy killing people in their dreams, it seems absolutely ludicrous, and it's realistic because if someone was telling you this, what would your reaction be? The thing is, though, because we as the audience know that what Nancy is saying is the truth, to us we are sort of saying to Marge, look, listen to Nancy, okay? I know it sounds stupid, I know it sounds strange and unreal, but just listen to her.
ouch. I've always felt at that moment that it must have hurt for the hat to hit the actress like that, but there's no reaction from her. So if it did actually hurt her, she's so in character that she's not letting it be known. And the thing is, though, it just looks painful. It might not have been even that painful, but it just looks like that to me. Now, Glenn hasn't actually said anything to Nancy about having dreams about Freddy Krueger, but I think it is safe to assume, based on his reaction earlier in the movie to Tina and Nancy talking about Freddy, that he actually has, and I feel that this is what has actually got him to do this research about dreams. The information here that he's giving to Nancy is going to be vital for her survival later. It's obviously been quite a few hours since Nancy left the house, so when she comes back to see all these bars on the window, it's quite possible to have actually had all this set up before she gets back home. The thing is though, having all this, it's going to cause problems for Nancy later because she won't be able to actually escape from the house because of these bars. On some level, I think Marge actually does believe a little of what Nancy has been saying. The problem is, though, Freddy isn't someone who comes from the real world and is going to break into your house to kill you. So her putting up these bars is still a futile thing, even though for her it's a peace of mind thing. That's another great theme with this movie is secrets being hidden from people and the fact that there's secrets that really need to be told because it could mean the person's survival in hearing it. I think this scene, even though it's an exposition scene, and if you've seen the movie before, we don't need this information, but on first time viewing, this scene is really good because the exposition is being delivered in a scenario that feels natural. It's not something that is happening when they're doing something else. So what is actually happening in this scene is relevant to what is actually being revealed in exposition. And even if you have seen the movie before, I still think this is an effective scene anyway.
That is quite a long time not to have had any sleep. The most I've probably gone without sleep is almost 48 hours. Exactly. That's the plan. Love this line. Which of course is the name of an awesome documentary that I think a lot of people should see if they haven't yet. Especially if you're a fan of the films. If you haven't seen that documentary, definitely, definitely watch it. It is awesome. I've seen it about four times now. And I'll probably watch it a lot more in the years to come. And Glenn's parents, of course, haven't told him about what happened with Freddy Krueger. It took a long time for Marge to get to that point, but at least she eventually told Nancy about it. One thing I'd love to be able to do in dreams is actually control what's happening and control the direction of where events are going. As far as I'm aware, I haven't been able to do this before, but it might just be because I haven't remembered the dream where it happened. I do know yet. though that I have actually been able to feel things in my dream and also hear what's going on. Actually, when I was having a dream once, in the dream I was being choked. But when I woke up, I realised that I had some phlegm caught in my throat and I was sleeping on my back. And I think that's just an example of how when we're dreaming, if there's something that's physically happening to us outside of our dream, that it actually finds its way into the dream somehow into our subconscious to let us know. It's kind of like if you're having a dream about needing to go to the toilet or it's raining heavily and then you wake up and you actually need to go to the toilet. Now this is, it's not as if Nancy was the one that put those bars on there. See, the thing is, it's not as if Rod and Tina were strangers to Nancy, so you can understand why Nancy would have such a hard time in the grieving process. But to think that uh, she's crazy or anything like that is a bit stupid, I think.
and since they're not going to let her talk to Glenn, they have unwittingly and unknowingly allowed his death to take place. If they let her talk to him, they would have walked up there, woke him up, and he would be fine. I'm sorry, but there won't be a tomorrow for Glenn. That kind of thing is similar to what happens in A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, where Kristen's mother drugs her drink so she'll go to sleep. It's interesting when you think about the fact that now we have all these smartphones, something like this where Glenn isn't able to speak to Nancy wouldn't actually happen nowadays because he'd have his own phone obviously and she'd have her own phone and unless the phones were actually taken off them or something then they'd still have a way to communicate with each other. For those who don't know, that's actually a poster of the band The Police behind Nancy's head right now. But oh look, she can't get out. Why? Because it's all locked up. If this wasn't locked up, she'd be able to rush over there and Glenn would survive. So Glenn is asleep and he's going to die. There's two occasions where he could have actually survived. But it's not to be. Bye, Glenn. The blood, the blood volcano. Imagine walking in and seeing this happening. From our perspective and Nancy's perspective as well, we both know that what's going on here is Freddy is killing people in their dreams, but everyone else isn't aware. So when they come in and they see this, from their perspective, it is a very strange occurrence. How the hell did Glenn get killed like this? There's no uh, way someone could have got into the house, done this in this manner, and then got out without anyone actually realizing or hearing anything.
The thing about Glenn's death in this movie too is that it is the most outlandish kill in the entire film. But when you compare it to the kills in the sequels, it's not as outlandish as those. I guess in a way you could call this scene the Home Alone on Elm Street moment. The book that Nancy was reading is definitely coming in handy here. Another example of how the character learns things and then puts what she's learnt into action so that she can survive. Now she's getting ready for Freddy. No one will know. Except for people like us, the audience, who know what's going on. Again, this music, this particular piece, love it. I've got chills right now just hearing it. But they're good chills. They're actually chills that make you feel good. You face things. That's your nature. That's your gift. I absolutely love that line. It really sums up Nancy really well. We have now reached the moment where Nancy is completely ready to go in and face Freddy again. She is armed with all the knowledge that she needs. She has set up the booby traps for Freddy when she brings him out into the real world. And so this is the moment of the film where Nancy really, really is strong enough to face Freddy and win. Here we go.
One thing I like to do, if possible, even if it's a horror movie I've seen before, I like to try and watch them at night time. Horror movies can still be effective when watching them during the day, I feel, but I just, I just prefer to see them at night. I think it just adds to the whole feeling of, of entering into a horror film. Going down, descending into the depths of the nightmare. The thing about the nightmare sequences in this movie is that when you look at the sequels, they of course put in a lot more fantastical elements into what's happening and to what Freddy can do inside the dream world. This doesn't take anything away from this movie, it's just interesting to see the progression from the original film and the other movies in the series as they went along. Thing is, Freddy has known you're there since the moment you fell asleep. I really like scenes like this in this film. You have a character just wandering around. In this situation she's finding a few things, like the crucifix. And then here you have her finding Glenn's headphones as well, a little souvenir that Freddie took. If you haven't seen this movie before, you would be wondering whether or not Nancy has actually succeeded in what she was trying to do.
you're not. And of course here we have another character who doesn't understand what's going on and is causing a delay. Now I may not have to actually mention this because it's probably quite obvious to many people but for those who haven't realised there's a mattress there of course for Robert Englund as Freddy to fall onto so he doesn't hurt himself. At least I think that was Robert Englund doing that shot but I could be wrong. Of course if these bars weren't here you should be able to get out easily. Uh, yeah, I think you better. You're only, what, a few minutes late? Freddy is now vulnerable. He can be hurt. In this way, he becomes just like a normal slasher villain that can be hurt and injured. Of course the reason why Freddy looks so fat in this scene is obviously because the stunt man had to wear a full body burn suit to get the shot done. Besides, it doesn't really ruin the film or anything. In fact, it's quite a good moment because Freddy is getting burnt yet again, just like he did when the parents did it. Freddy is not as omnipotent as he was at the start of the movie now. He doesn't have the same power and control that he had because he was obviously in the dream world. Now that he's in the real world, that's all been taken away. I'm not sure if there's a novelization of this movie, but if there is, I hope they would go into detail about what characters are thinking at certain moments. That's something I like to think about in movies. What is the character thinking? And so, in this situation, what is Nancy's father thinking as he's seeing all this happening? So now Nancy's father is confronted with a supernatural occurrence. In this movie it's not explained how Freddy can do the things that he can do. Nancy doesn't know how he can do it, all that she knows is that he can. Now Nancy's father is finally seeing the truth of what's happening, even if to him it seems impossible, it's the truth. Nancy, of course, must now face Freddy alone. She's going to soon use what she has learned to defeat Freddy. That was such a cool in-camera on-set practical effect.
I love it what Nancy does in this scene. This is another example of how a psychological approach to this film has also been taken. The death of Freddy here is simple and effective. Obviously in the sequels they come up with more creative and more elaborate ways to kill him, but in this movie I think that doing it this way is really, really effective and doesn't take away anything from the film. The way this is shot with all the smoke and that, you can't really expect this to just be real life again, so this part has to be a dream as well. If you haven't seen this movie before, you might be thinking that you're in for a happy ending. It's an ambiguous ending, it makes you wonder what the hell is actually going on. You could take the stance that the entire movie has been a dream and that Freddy Krueger has been in control of it. This being in 1984, the credits for the end of the film aren't going to be 10 minutes long like a lot of ones are today. So as the audience, we quite literally have had a nightmare on Elm Street. The whole film has been a nightmare. This is quite a cool song that's playing in the credits. I'm not sure if you can actually get it on its own, but I do feel that even though it's quite cheesy in some ways, I do think it actually fits the film. I like audio commentaries where they keep talking even though the credits are rolling. I don't really like it much when they just stop talking as soon as the film stops. I feel in some ways it's kind of like a chance for them to add some extra information that they might have forgot earlier in the film and things of that nature so I always like to see audio commentaries where this happens in the credits. The way I got to see this film was actually at a friend's place. My parents wouldn't have let me rent this movie at that age, we were about 11 years old, but his parents let him. We rented the first three movies, we watched the first two back to back that night. Of course it had such an effect on me that I had dreams about Freddy Krueger that night. We didn't watch the third one until the next morning, and then over the next couple of months or so we watched the next films in the series. The thing about watching this movie though was that weeks and weeks after, whenever I would think about it, just thinking about the movie created a feeling of sickness in the pit of my stomach, and to this day a horror film has never ever had that same effect on me since. And so that's why when I watch a horror movie, I'm not necessarily getting scared by what I'm seeing, and that's not a bad thing, it just means that I need to focus on other aspects of the film. And as long as the horror movie is being true to the genre that it's being, as long as it's being uh, creepy, as long as it has a great atmosphere, the tone, everything like the music, that kind of thing, that's what I look for in a horror movie. So while horror movies don't scare me anymore, they're still my favourite kind of film, it's my favourite genre. This has been Rod Zombie. Thanks for listening. A Nightmare on Elm Street.